North Korea, a highly militarized state, dominated by one family for over half a century. The product of a conflict reinforced by a nuclear threat that still endures today. It began with the Korean War, fought between 1950 and 1953, a war that led to deep ideological and physical divisions between North and South and reverberated across the world. There's no way to understand what's going on today without understanding of the Korean War. How can you understand this Korean conflict that we are having without understanding of the origin of that conflict? Nearly 70 years on, this unresolved conflict continues to pose a serious threat to America and its allies. The Korean War was one of the bloodiest chapters in the country's history. A civil war that nearly ignited World War III. We are united in detesting communist slavery. It took the lives of tens of thousands of soldiers and millions of Koreans. When they came, they came in waves. A wave, a wave, a wave, a wave. I threw three cartons of grenades that night. We could hear the bugles sounding and uh, all the screaming and what have you. And their sole purpose was to annihilate the 1st Marine Division. The Korean War was one of the most vicious, violent, nauseating wars uh, of the 20th century. The United States dropped more ordnance on North Korea in that three-year war than we dropped during the entire Second World War. For North Koreans, the Korean War is not a memory. It's still very much alive. Good evening from the White House in Washington. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. The world will note that the first atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima, a military base. Nagasaki, target for the second atomic bomb. Just three days after Hiroshima... London newspapers this morning are speculating that a new surrender ultimatum to Japan may be likely soon. At the close of World War II, the Americans turned their attention to the surrender of Japanese forces in Korea. With Soviet troops already deployed in northern Korea and marching southward, the U.S. military needed to act quickly. The United States was much further away. Its troops were much further away than were Soviet troops. What that meant was suddenly the Americans had to try and establish some agreements with Stalin, the leader in the Soviet Union, on Korea. The Americans proposed that the United States and the Soviet Union establish zones. On the 10th of August, 1945, two U.S. Army officers were given a mission to divide Korea before the Soviets could occupy the entire country. Armed with only a National Geographic map of Asia, Colonels Rusk and Bonesteel, who knew little about Korea, zeroed in on the peninsula. They had 30 minutes to really divide up the country. And they looked at the wall, and there was a map of the Korean Peninsula, and they said, well, why don't we just kind of divide it here in this 38th parallel? The 38th parallel was just north of Seoul, and they wanted the national capital to be in the American zone. And with very little discussion, that decision goes up to Truman and is made in a proposal to Stalin. The 38th parallel was simply a line on a map. It followed no physical features. It divided farms and villages, severed 300 roads, and cut across six railways. The Soviets accepted it. Korea had been cut in two without a word of input from a single Korean. Koreans were one people for thousands of years, and the Koreans didn't have a lot of choice. You know, it's not even a big country. It was just divided, and that took all of 30 minutes. It was a 30-minute decision. 
And so the 38th parallel becomes this temporary dividing line between northern and southern Korea. But the temporary dividing line congeals into effectively a permanent dividing line when the Soviet Union and the United States fall out. The Cold War intervened and American troops didn't go home. At the end of World War II, the United States and the Soviet Union had emerged as superpowers. By 1946, the map of the world was split between the conflicting ideologies of democracy and communism. In the Soviet Union, Joseph Stalin tightened his hold on power and began to extend communist influence throughout Europe. U.S. President Truman, sworn in after the death of Franklin D. Roosevelt, was both unpopular and untested on the world stage. Yet he was determined to advance America's post-war interest. The policy of the Truman administration was that the United States needed to focus on containing the Soviet Union, keeping Soviet power and Soviet ideology, communism, from spreading. It wasn't simply the tanks and troops of the Soviet Union. It was this ideology. It was the belief system of communism. Europe was the Cold War's first battleground. Neither side was interested in events on the faraway Korean Peninsula. For U.S. strategic planners, Korea really didn't figure much in the picture at all. To the extent that we cared about Asia, U.S. strategic planners believed that the only power in Asia would continue to be Japan. The Japanese defeat in World War II ended their occupation of Korea, a history marred by the brutal subjugation of the Korean people. Japan succeeded in colonizing Korea in 1910. That led to terrible hardships for millions of Koreans. And then the Japanese used Koreans as mobile capital and labor throughout the empire. You have the mobilization of 200,000 Korean soldiers into the Japanese army, most of them drafted. As many as 100 to 200,000 women were dragooned into serving uh, dozens of Japanese soldiers every day as sex slaves. So when they were liberated in 45, the Koreans thought this was the beginning of a bright, bright future for them and uh, that this division would end very quickly. Park Kyung Soon was just nine years old when she heard the news over the radio that the Japanese had surrendered. There was celebration, relief that this period of Japanese rule was over, but there was a power vacuum that opened up. Dependent on the evolving relationship between the Soviets and the Americans, and as it turned out, the Soviets and the Americans couldn't reach an agreement on how to unify the Korean Peninsula. To control their occupied territories, the Soviets and Americans put in power men they could trust. In the South, the Americans supported Sigmund Rhee, a Princeton-educated Christian who'd been lobbying the U.S. government for the job throughout World War II. 
To consolidate his authority, Re crushed political dissent, killing thousands of communist guerrillas. Re was an authoritarian, semi-thug with great contacts. He wasn't a nice man. But Americans of certainly this period tended to believe if somebody could speak English and had been educated in the United States, that, oh, well, that means they've absorbed all kinds of democratic values. Well, that's not, that doesn't happen to be the case. Singman Ree just happened to be, as Franklin Roosevelt would have said, our SOB and rather than theirs. In the North, the Soviets picked Kim Il-sung, an unknown expat who had been radicalized by the Japanese occupation. Kim Il-sung was really unknown. But then when the Japanese took control of the Korean Peninsula during the occupation in the first half of the 20th century, Kim Il-sung transformed. He became known as a guerrilla fighter fighting against the Japanese in China. And from that point on had basically a price on his head as an anti-Japan conspirator by the colonial government. He eventually moved to the Soviet Union where he learned uh, Russian and became close to a number of key Russian generals. Kim quickly solidified his power and amassed a formidable army. By 1949, Kim had burnished his image as supreme leader, creating the myth of a fearsome guerrilla fighter who single-handedly defeated the Japanese. The idea was, our country has suffered for generations because we had no a great leader. And then great leader emerged. He liberated us from the Japanese occupation. It was patently untrue, because Kim Il-sung, during the war with Japan, the decisive stage, was far away from the front line in a small Soviet military base. Kim Il-sung was one of the shrewdest politicians of his era, but a particularly brutal and ruthless person who knew how to gain power and hold on to it. There are striking similarities between Reap and Kim Il-sung. Both of them are the same types of expat uh, nationalist leaders who have big plans and, uh, with themselves at the center. Both of them have a strong vision of a unified Korea. And both of them believe that they're Fundamental power came from their ability to manipulate outside sponsors, in Rhee's case, the United States, and in Kim Il-sung's case, the Soviet Union. In 1949, Mao's victory over the American-backed nationalist in China emboldened Kim. The time was right for a unified communist Korea. Kim traveled to Moscow to lobby Stalin to back an invasion of the South. He was rebuffed by the Soviet leader, who believed the U.S. presence made war too risky. But by January 1950, Stalin had had a change of heart. Now, what happened in between, say, September of 1949 and the end of January 1950? Dean Acheson, who was the American Secretary of State in January of 1950, January 12th, made a major speech to the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. And in the speech, he left South Korea out of the American defense perimeter in the Pacific. And Stalin obviously noticed that. Stalin now believes that the Americans will not get involved in Korea. He's absolutely convinced. So he says, OK, I'll give you my blessing but you have to ask now for the final decision. Stalin's position was something like, well, comrades, you say that you will win soon. It's your idea, and we will provide you with ammunition and money and everything, but it will be your responsibility. If something gets really bad, don't count on our support. <laughs> 
In May 1950, Kim traveled to China to meet Mao. Mao is one of the most experienced leaders in the world with his own gigantic army that had just proceeded to clear the mainland of nationalist forces and who had many uh, allies who had fought with Kim Il-sung and other guerrillas throughout the 1930s. I think Kim Il-sung had good reason to believe that he would have plenty of comrades in China that would help him. Kim was masterful at, at uh, maneuvering between Stalin and, and Mao and then ended up getting support from both of them. By the summer of 1950, Kim Il-sung was ready to invade the South assuring Mao that he would be greeted as a liberator and take the peninsula in a matter of days. News that communist troops have invaded southern Korea. Invading their fellow countrymen to the south to bring another international crisis to the already long-suffering world. At 4 a.m. on the 25th of June, 1950, North Korean troops raced across the 38th parallel. Kim's invasion of the South had begun. Basically, the South Korean army either couldn't fight or didn't fight or ran away. The North Koreans were in Seoul in three days. Some South Korean men went into hiding to avoid conscription into the communist army. Others were put on trial and publicly shamed for not pledging allegiance to the party. Beatings, kidnappings, and executions were routine. 이제 그 젊은 우리도 포함된 젊은 사람들이 이제 붙들려가는 거예요. 이제 저 이민군의 그걸 의용군이라고 해서 의용군에 가담 지키느라고 그때부터 이제 나는 숨어 저희 창고 같은 데 숨어 지냈다고 나는 숨어 지내게 됐지. The South Koreans just couldn't stop them, and they they just fell apart. Uh, the uh, reaction in Washington was one of shock. Gentlemen, we, we face a serious situation. We hope we face it in the cause of peace. By now, news of the invasion had reached the Allied Supreme Commander in Japan. Douglas MacArthur was an American war hero. His face had appeared six times already on the cover of Time magazine. Douglas MacArthur was the scion of a military family. His father had fought in the Civil War and won the Medal of Honor. Douglas MacArthur was a brilliant student at West Point. He was a gallant soldier in World War I. He won all of the medals any one of his generation could win. He was the supreme commander of Allied forces in the Southwestern Pacific during World War II. MacArthur was a very proud, self-confident, vainglorious individual who had a complete belief in his own truths, whether they were based on fact or not. Uh, he considered himself a man of destiny, and he had an ego the size of China. But he was a master on the battlefield. From his command in Tokyo, MacArthur assured Washington that he could handle the North Koreans with one arm tied behind his back. But the Truman administration, intent on shrinking the defense budget, had only a small advisory team left behind in Korea. After World War II, America built down its military, not expecting that it would have to be used again, at least nothing on that scale. So at the time of the outbreak of the Korean War, the American military was a shadow of what it had been 
in World War II. As long as we had a monopoly of nuclear weapons, we could relax a little bit in terms of the manpower we had in the Army. We had to very quickly put together two regiments. They took half of my platoon and filled me up with reserves, many of whom had never even been to boot camp. I had just turned 17, and uh, I was sent to uh, Camp Drake, Japan, there outside of Tokyo. And all we done was process and train to uh, make an amphibious landing and head for Korea. On them, world peace depends. They will not fail. They never have. The Americans were pretty confident. You could even argue they maybe were a little bit cocky. Their first encounter was with North Korean troops that had Soviet T-34 tanks. And the American forces had no weapons. The bazookas they had would not penetrate the armor of a T-34 tank. And so when they entered into battle, at first they ran. They uh, saw their comrades being killed around them. Uh, and, and it gradually got a, a name that was called the bugging out. Uh, they would bug out. When we were still in Camp Drake in Japan, we were told at that time that uh, it was going to be an easy war to, to finish, you know. We were told that the North Koreans' uh, slant eyes, they couldn't see to the right or the left flank. They could only see to the front that you could actually sneak in behind the, the North Koreans and get them, you know. But we found out that, that wasn't truth, you know. Them suckers had eyes in the back and also in the front, you know. All we could do was just run back as fast as we could, and they were right after us. You know? conquest by Soviet Russia endangers our liberty and endangers the kind of world in which the free spirit of men can survive. The Soviet Union had an atomic bomb, a tight grip on Eastern Europe, and a powerful alliance with Mao's China. It wasn't a good thing that China went communist. This was a dire threat to the United States. And so when communist forces of North Korea invaded South Korea, Truman figured, I need to do something about this. If politically the Truman administration loses South Korea, it's going to appear, first of all, to my domestic critics that I am a terrible president. And there's the whole question of American credibility. Our potential allies, like in Europe, which was our top priority, would say, well, in the end, the Americans can't be depended upon. Korea is a small country thousands of miles away. But what is happening there is important to every American. It was really inevitable that the Americans were going to do whatever they could to stop the North Koreans. We are united in detesting communist slavery. We know that the cost of freedom is high, but we are determined to preserve our freedom no matter what the cost. What Americans most wanted after World War II was to come home and to have families and to get about the business of peacetime affairs. Harry Truman recognized that if a lot of Americans started getting killed in Korea, the war could turn unpopular very quickly. To share the burden would make the war in Korea politically more acceptable. To show his resolve, Truman bypassed Congress and took his plan directly to the newly formed United Nations. The armed invasion of the Republic of Korea continues. This is, in fact, an attack on the United Nations itself. On the 27th of June, two days after the invasion, the Security Council passed a resolution authorizing military intervention. 
By June 30th, Truman had approved the use of American troops. The first time an American president had unilaterally committed the country to war. I didn't know where Korea was until uh, I heard we was having a war with North Korea. I lied, to, I was 16 when that went in. But uh, the Second World War had just finished and uh, I had no idea that I would ever be involved in a war. When the war started in June of 1950, early one morning I received a telephone call saying, Lieutenant Connor, you're now in the Army. I said, what's this? was I didn't really know where Korea was until I looked at the map and figured out uh, it was far from my home. The term of art at the time was a police action. There is someone who has disturbed the peace. You call out the police and the police go to it. And so this term police action seemed to be a nice dodge around why Truman wasn't asking Congress for a declaration of war. It's not really a war. It's just this police action. You know, we was uh, Harry's police force. Thought it was kind of funny. Here we are fighting a war, and he's calling it a police action. By July 1950, some 50,000 U.S. troops followed by thousands more from Great Britain, Australia, Thailand, and 12 other nations headed toward Korea. North Korean troops were streaming down the peninsula at lightning speed. Kim Il-sung's promise that he would take the South in a matter of days was coming true. All up and down the line, people couldn't quite figure out the North Koreans. John Foster Dulles, who was Truman's roving ambassador for East Asia policy, said he can't figure out what keeps these masses of troops come shrieking on, or maybe they're on drugs, or maybe the Soviets have found some way to program these people. Uh, and in fact, they were fighting and dying for their homeland, for the unification of their homeland. What you have really in the situation is this brutal civil war overlaid with an international war between two ideological foes of the Cold War, the Soviet Union and the United States. To try to slow the North Korean onslaught, MacArthur sent the U.S. Army's 7th Cavalry to intercept them in the city of Taejong. We could see the North Koreans, they were coming in waves. So by the time we killed the first two waves, we were fighting with bayonets because we were out of ammunition. The North Koreans, by mid-July, had a pincer down the east coast from the north and then coming around from the southwest and along the southern coast. And if the Marines had not landed around that time and stiffened the lines, the war would have been lost. They form what we call the Pusan perimeter, which is considered basically the last good spot across the peninsula to establish a defensive position. Caught in the crossfire between advancing North Korean troops and UN forces were hundreds of thousands of Korean refugees who now filled the roads between Seoul and Busan. My father and my grandparents had to walk the distance from Seoul to Busan. That's really walking the distance from uh, Washington, D.C. to New York. When the war broke out, my grandparents talked about how they ran to Busan perimeter, the family split up. My grandmother went with my aunts and my grandfather went with the boys, my uncle and my father, and he lost actually one of my uncles during the move to Busan. For UN troops, already outmanned and overwhelmed by the North Korean army, the refugee crisis presented yet another challenge. North Korean soldiers hiding amongst villagers to get behind enemy lines. There were only a handful of main roads along which you could travel with tanks or with other sorts of equipment. 
On those very same roads, you had civilians that were trying to evacuate. American troops did not know who was the enemy and who was the ally. There was always this fear about refugees that created a great deal of moral dilemma among American soldiers. You see a bunch of refugees, you think that North Koreans are hiding among them, do you shoot against them or not? In some instances, U.S. forces did shoot, and refugees were sacrificed in the panic. Yang Hei Suk was 13 in July 1950 when war came to Im Ri a tiny farming town 100 miles south of Seoul. First Cavalry Division troops had forced the people of these two villages called Chugakri and Mkri to evacuate and get on the main road south. Chong Kudo's family were also among the hundreds of refugees led by U.S. troops to a place called No Gunri. As the refugees gathered on nearby railway tracks, American planes began to circle before opening fire. 비행기가 돌아가더니 한참을 있더니 얼마나 거기서 오래 여기서 시간이 끌었어요. 그 와서 막탕 하고 싸우는 게. The refugees ran for cover under a bridge, where survivors claim the 7th Cavalry fired on them for three days and nights. Fearful North Korean soldiers were among them. Young Hei Suk, surrounded by casualties, was hiding under her mother's skirt when she heard her uncle cry out in pain. 거기 이제 이런 눈을 뜨고 엄마 공업을 죽어서 하는 머리에 뭐가 눈을 탁 세리 여기를 나를 탁 세리서 탁 세리는 머리에 막 이렇게 했는데 뭐 내가 눈이 참쑥 빠진 거예요 눈이 쑥 빠졌으니 그래 엄마 이거 좀 띄줘 눈좀 띄줘 눈을 띄야 내가 엎드려 살지 막 이런 게로 우리 엄마가 또 많이 맞아가지고 그래 안 돼가지고 이제 an investigation found Pentagon files that supported the survivors' accounts. There were orders flying around the war front to treat civilians as enemy. Orders from the very top command, the 8th Army, to stop any refugee movement across lines. Every war is horrible. But uh, the Korean War, among American wars, was the war that had the greatest proportion of civilian casualties. Omer Garza was a 17-year-old private with the Army's 7th Cavalry. He arrived at No Gungri just as the massacre ended. There were two tunnels side by side. When we got there, there must have been about 300 South Korean civilians that were killed there. One thing I, I, I never forget, there was a woman, a, a mother, laying there on her back, and she had a little baby about, uh, probably about, uh, not more than, uh, than eight or nine months old, trying to, trying to nurse on the dead body there. It was a very dirty war, and that also demoralized American soldiers. They didn't quite know what they were fighting for, and they were forced to do things that they didn't do in World War II. 
We received orders that anything in front of us was the enemy. No matter who was in front of us, if they didn't shoot at you, you, shot, you would shoot at them. It was increasingly clear to the UN troops that this bloody conflict was not bound by modern rules of engagement. Atrocities were being committed on all sides. Early in August, there was a massacre of, of captured American troops by the North Koreans as the North Koreans left a hilltop, Hill 303. Uh, they, they simply uh, bound and then shot in the back of the head about 30 American prisoners. Photos of this were run in the Stars and Stripes newspaper, which was getting to the troops in Korea. Some of them cut the photo out and carried it in the inside of their helmets. Uh, so once something like that happens, that sort of frees some men at least to do the same thing to the enemy. We would capture 15, 20 enemy and uh, supply one or two men to escort this POWs back to the rear. I said, uh, if they try to get away from you, open up with your machine guns and your rifles. Don't let them get away. And they would be gone for uh, 10 or 15 minutes when we would hear the machine guns going off. While casualties continued to mount through the summer of 1950, the North Korean army maintained their advantage. All the high American officers had been heroes of World War II, whether it's the uh, General MacArthur or Curtis LeMay or Matthew Ridgway. These were people who were famous in the battles that defeated the Nazis and the Japanese. The tide of battle still favors the aggressors. The United Nations forces in Korea are forced to improvise their defense. And here it is, 1950, only five years later, and they're getting their butt whipped by rough peasant armies. MacArthur was used to fighting with his back to the wall. From his headquarters in Japan, he was quietly putting together a plan for a bold counterattack. He hoped to ambush the communist forces behind their lines, landing at the port of Incheon and cutting off their supply lines. Extreme tides and shallow waters made Incheon a risky spot for invasion. Precisely the reason MacArthur believed it would work. Nobody thought it was practical. Everybody was against it because it was so impractical. The time frame for landing those amphibious vehicles was very limited to a few hours. But MacArthur really believed that because of its impracticality, the North Koreans wouldn't defend. The Joint Chiefs of Staff thought that this was not a particularly good idea, but they were in an odd position. MacArthur was essentially politically untouchable, and there was nobody in the military chain of command who would tell MacArthur no. I think that so many people said you can't do this, the more you do that to somebody like MacArthur, you kind of increase their resistance to change. The more you tell them not to do something, the more likely it is you're going to get it. We didn't know where we were going. Out in the ocean, we were told we were going to Incheon to make a landing. I don't think I knew enough to be scared. <laughs> it had a 26-foot tide, and you had to go in at high tide. I mean, it takes a lot of time to get a division ashore, total division. So I was pretty, uh, I was nervous, naturally. On the 15th of September, 70,000 UN troops stood at anchor off the Korean coast, awaiting high tide and MacArthur's order to attack. 
one admiral said if you drew up all the things that made amphibious operations difficult, then China had them all. The tides are bad, the harbor's all mud. Who knew how many guns were sitting in it? Lieutenant Richard Carey was leading a platoon of Marines that day. At 5 p.m., MacArthur gave his unit the order to attack. We only had a couple hours before it was dark. The only place we could go in was into an inlet. And when we got into the inlet, it was surrounded by barbed wire. And I started cutting the wire. And a sniper shot off my radio, was strapped on my shoulder. And the guy on the other side of me took one right between the eye. We were getting shot at when we hit the beach. But uh, I don't think they expected this. Despite initial resistance, they then headed east to cut off North Korean supply lines. MacArthur had caught the North Koreans by surprise. His gamble had paid off. It was such a daring strike and such a rapid strike that it changed the momentum in the war entirely. The United States and the South Koreans were losing badly until then. All of a sudden, they were winning. <laughs> I mean, it was such a risky operation, and the fact that he brought it off without any problem. MacArthur was viewed as a kind of god. In one stroke, MacArthur cemented his reputation for military genius. The tide of the war turned as the North Korean troops scrambled back to the 38th parallel. In just two weeks, Seoul was back in the hands of the United Nations, and President Ri was restored. MacArthur's forces were now sitting at the 38th parallel, with fresh troops, superior air power, and momentum. There's a drastic alteration of the military situation. Suddenly, the Americans and South Koreans are on the verge of going across the 38th parallel and into the north. And obviously, military leaders want to take advantage of the immediate situation. Having taken the advantage, MacArthur wanted to pursue the conflict into North Korea. He wanted to unite the peninsula in the name of democracy and issue a decisive blow against communism in Asia. MacArthur's aggressive worldview was at odds with President Truman's idea of a limited war. But with MacArthur's success at Incheon, Truman saw an opportunity. MacArthur says, give me just a little bit more time, and I can end the war. I can capture or destroy all the North Korean forces. Truman, who just weeks before had worried about the fact that he was going to be charged with losing more ground to the communists, thought, I can do something that no president before me has ever done. I can take ground back from the communists. On the 7th of October, 1950, MacArthur's troops stormed north across the border. Victories came quickly as UN forces pursued the remaining North Korean army and continued to pound them from the sky. People were lighting cigars all over Washington and Seoul when American troops were marching up uh, the peninsula in October 1950. MacArthur arrived in Pyongyang, the capital of North Korea. He gets off his plane and he says, where's Kim Buk Tu? Uh, isn't he here to greet me? Only two months after UN troops had faced annihilation at Pusan, their flag flew above Kim's capital city, Pyongyang. We had already taken Pyongyang. We didn't have too much resistance from the Koreans at all. A devastating blow against communism was within reach. MacArthur's forces pressed closer to the Yalu River, North Korea's border with China. 
MacArthur argues that really he needs American forces to go all the way to the Allo in order to clean up the situation and do it quickly. And the administration back in Washington faced with strong Republican attacks on the Democratic administration being weak on Asia. The Truman administration does not say no to MacArthur. Saying no to MacArthur was difficult for Truman, an unpopular president seen as badly mismanaging the war in Korea. Needing assurances from his general on the war's future course, Truman requested a meeting. MacArthur, ensconced in Tokyo, forced Truman to fly to Wake Island in the Pacific. MacArthur greeted his commander-in-chief not with the traditional salute, but with a mere handshake. MacArthur had been overstating his authority for many months. He would hold news conferences, and he would speak very often as the United Nations commander and not report directly to the President of the United States. So Truman flies all the way out to Wake Island in the Pacific, hoping on the basis of MacArthur's repeated assurances, the war is nearly over and Korea will be liberated. He puts the question to MacArthur, if American troops get close to the border, will the Chinese enter the war? And MacArthur says they won't dare. And if they do, I will annihilate them. We were pumped up. MacArthur put it out. He said, uh, we're going as far as the Yalu and probably are going right into China. So uh, we, were, we were pretty enthusiastic. We said, this is going to be the end of it. We'll win the war right here. MacArthur is assuring them that the war is nearly over. He kept saying that American troops will be home by Christmas, that the war is wrapping up. When American troops had their Thanksgiving dinner and they're thinking, Christmas, that's only a month away. We're all going to get to go home. In late November 1950, 30,000 UN troops paused their advance. They sat down in the frozen hills and valleys around the Choshin Reservoir to enjoy a hot Thanksgiving dinner, courtesy of the US government. We was dug in in the hills up there. The headquarters had set up uh, cooks and they, we had uh, our Thanksgiving dinner. They didn't have serving trays at the time I got through there and they, I just went ahead and took my helmet liner out of the helmet and uh, used my helmet and I had my Thanksgiving dinner in 1950 in a helmet. And then uh, when we moved out of where we was dug in after Thanksgiving, we went on up to Udamity, that's when uh, all hell broke loose. The UN forces were caught in a massive trap sprung by the Chinese. MacArthur had miscalculated. Mao's army had entered the war. Attacking at night to retain the element of surprise and to avoid aerial bombardment, hundreds of thousands of Chinese troops stormed the front line in an overwhelming display of force. Over 200,000 Chinese managed to infiltrate across the Yalu River. When the Americans are taken by surprise, they find that they're basically surrounded. And instead of fighting for victory, they're fighting for their lives. We could hear the bugles sounding and uh, all the screaming and what have you, and uh, the Chinese coming at you in hordes. But we was outnumbered probably uh, five to one, 10 to one, something like it. And their sole purpose was to annihilate the 1st Marine Division. When they came, they came in waves. A wave, a wave, a wave, a wave. 
the platoon sergeant, he and I were in foxhole together. So he took the grenades out all night, handed them to me. I counted them, 1,001, 1,002, and threw them. I threw three cartons of grenades that night. That night was bitterly cold. God, it was cold. It was below 50, below zero. Gigantic one, that's not all that much. It's a little bit of 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 추워서 불을 놔야 되겠고 시체를 이렇게 죽어나라 인민군 죽었는 거 그다음에 한국군 공원 전담 이거를 이렇게 둘로 싸놓고 그 중간에다가 불을 놓고 지낸 적이 있어요. they pretty much consigned themselves to die one way or the other. They were going to get killed by a Chinese bullet or mortar round, or they were going to freeze. And it was merely a matter of how long can we put this off. West of Choshin, the 7th Cavalry were also battling the Chinese and extreme cold. Our fingers uh, would crack as you tried to close your hand in with uh, being so damn cold. And we got the old blanket sleeping bags, and we cut strips of, of the blanket and wrap it around our feet uh, uh, to try to keep them, our feet from freezing. It was so cold that uh, it wouldn't take more than uh, four or five minutes after a guy was killed that he was froze solid. If we were staying in the same hill for a while, we would get the dead. Chinese and the, and the dead Koreans and stand them up against the trees. Uh, frozen solid, yeah. When you saw one of those Marines bodies froze stiff, that was sad. Arms sticking out, legs sticking out. You really knew you was more then. It's hard to describe, it truly is. You had to be careful how you picked them up. When you picked him up by a, an arm, for example, you could break the arm off. There was no option but to retreat. Over 10 days, UN troops fought their way out of the reservoir at the cost of 18,000 casualties. The whole ethos of the American approach to war was advance, attack. And when the soldiers saw that we can't attack, in fact, it's going to be everything we can do simply to escape, to flee, and get out of this alive. It was exceedingly disorienting. These were soldiers, many of them whom were in their first combat. They hadn't seen anything like this. They had never really confronted the basic questions of life and death. They told us to straighten up as we was coming into Hagari and come in there like real Marines. We were singing the Marine Corps hymn, all gung-ho, you know. And... The tide of the war had changed once again. UN troops were forced back below the 38th parallel. Within weeks, Seoul fell to the combined North Korean and Chinese forces. Bloody fighting in and around Seoul would see the capital chain sides four times. With bad news from the front and growing public discontent, Truman was forced to confront a war that seemed unwinnable. No one seriously talked about the use of atomic weapons in Korea until the end of November, beginning of December 1950. When American forces were fleeing for their lives upon the Chinese entry into the war, then it certainly occurred to members of the public to ask, well, 
How can we lose to North Korea? How can we lose to China when we've got the bomb and they don't? In the press, General MacArthur made a case to expand the conflict into China. In the war room, he was making plans to use the atomic bomb. MacArthur wanted an unlimited war. He wanted to use 24 atomic bombs. In December 1950, he said, I want 24 atomic bombs to establish a radiation cordon along the Yalu River, uh, you know, using cobalt, which has a half-life of 90 years, and the two places will be separated, you know, for a long time, generations to come. In November of 50, Truman was asked about the use of atomic weapons, and he, he said, yes, uh, this would have to be considered. That was the first mentioned by him. Then the next question is, well, who is going to determine whether the bomb will be used or not? Truman said, without thinking very clearly, that the decision will be made by the commander in the field. Well, everybody realized the commander in the field is Douglas MacArthur. Harry Truman has just announced this policy that the atom bomb is available for use in Korea and that Douglas MacArthur is gonna make the decision. Oh boy, what have we got ourselves in for? The president has stated that the use of the atomic bomb is being considered to halt the communist onrush. It may well precipitate World War III. News that Truman was considering a nuclear attack set America's allies on edge. Clement Attlee is the British prime minister and he is in a meeting of parliament, and he hears this stir in the back and kind of wonders what's going on. And somebody passes him a note explaining that the president of the United States has threatened the use of the atom bomb in Korea. A new war brought Britain's Prime Minister Attlee to Washington for talks with President Truman. The Prime Minister of Great Britain raced across the Atlantic to try and bring some sanity back into the situation. Truman's statements deepened public skepticism of his abilities as commander-in-chief. General MacArthur's campaign for the expansion of the war into China increasingly put the two men at odds. MacArthur wanted to roll back. He wanted to keep on going into China and try to settle the hash of the Chinese Revolution. That was his great error in Truman's eyes. Truman wanted a limited rollback. He wanted to roll North Korean communists back and unify the peninsula. MacArthur feels like this is the place where we're going to have to have this great battle against communism, even to the extent that he's willing to risk World War III. Truman said to MacArthur, if this war gets any bigger, we don't have the resources, we don't have the military establishment to do that. General MacArthur, your job is to buy time. Well, that cut against everything that MacArthur wanted. No, no, in war, there is no substitute for victory. We fight to win, not simply to hold ground. Truman learned from Hiroshima and Nagasaki that no true victory in that sense is, is possible anymore, and so he really wanted to limit the war. MacArthur couldn't deal with that defeat. Truman had given him a directive on, on December 5th not to say anything publicly against the, the policy of the Truman administration, and MacArthur consistently defied that directive. On the 11th of April, 1951, President Truman addressed the nation. I have considered it essential to relieve General MacArthur so that there would be no doubt or confusion as to the real purpose and aim of our policy. It was with the deepest personal regret that I found myself compelled to take this action. General MacArthur is one of our greatest military commanders. But the cause of world peace is much more important than any individual. For Truman, this was an issue that transcended the moment in Korea. This had everything to do with how America was going to be governed in the Cold War. Truman recognized that the Korean War was not one of a kind. There would be other challenges like this. And so he made a point of relieving MacArthur simply because his view of what American policy should be was different than the president's. General MacArthur was far from damaged. On the 16th of April, he left Japan. In New York, he was given a ticker tape parade and was invited to speak to Congress. For many, 
MacArthur was the last great World War II hero. In living rooms across the country, Americans hung on his every word. MacArthur knows that this audience is primed to approve of him. I stand on this rostrum with a sense of deep humility and great pride. And he speaks in a very stentorian voice. And he plays the crowd. But I still remember the refrain of one of the most popular barrack ballads of that day, which proclaimed most proudly that old soldiers never die. They just fade away. And like the old soldier of that ballad, I now close my military career and just fade away. And there was not a dry eye in the house. In private, Truman fumed, calling the speech a bunch of damn bullshit. His decision to fire MacArthur nearly cost him his presidency. I think his popularity rate sank to 22%. I mean, he was an extremely unpopular leader because he didn't see in terms of victory or defeat. He said, we had to limit this war. By the spring of 1951, the Korean War had reached a stalemate. Under the new leadership of General Matthew Ridgway, UN forces were dug in around the 38th parallel. Trading ground against North Korean and Chinese forces, one bloody battle at a time. What we were doing at that time was very different than what had been early in the war. They call that the stalemate at the time, which is what it was. But living in the trenches there is like living as animals. You were living in the dirt, you ate in the dirt. That was a little bit hard on the morale. It was a terribly bloody and demoralizing experience. There was a dynamic that basically meant that neither side could win. Most of the casualties take place in this period for no good purpose. Armistice talks between the UN, China, and North Korea, begun in the summer of 1951, dragged on for months, then years. The Soviet Union continued stonewalling. United Kingdom. Yes. United States. Yes. Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. No. Stalin was willing to fight the Korean War to the last Chinese soldier. It was keeping the Americans engaged in Korea rather than building up in Europe. In order to break the communist will, Americans stepped up their air campaign in North Korea. All of the cities in North Korea were essentially flattened. Uh, it, it got so that uh, the pilots and, and the uh, squadron leaders, etc., were complaining they had no more targets. A written directive to the Fifth Air Force in North Korea had ordered that every installation, every town, every village be destroyed. They dropped a lot of napalm. Uh, napalm had been invented at the end of World War II, but not used much. It was used 
indiscriminately uh, across uh, North Korea. And they thought that that was the price that you had to pay to avoid a larger war, World War III, with China. And so basically North Korea became that kind of victim to force the communists to negotiate the armistice. The Republican Party is back in power. General Dwight D. Eisenhower is elected. Even President Eisenhower, a Republican who'd won the 1952 election on a pledge to end the war in Korea, could do little to change the situation on the ground. The mere fact that Dwight Eisenhower, the hero of the European side of World War II, was going to go, he was going to put his mind to it. Now, in fact, the end came not because Eisenhower went to Korea. He went, he looked around, basically came home. But the key was the death of Joseph Stalin. In March 1953, the Soviet dictator unexpectedly died of a cerebral hemorrhage. Once Stalin's gone, his body's hardly cold when the reigning Central Committee of the Presidium sends a message to the Chinese and North Koreans, get an armistice. It took several months to agree on an armistice line. The communists initially argued for the 38th parallel, which was an indefensible line on a map. The Americans insisted on another line, a line that was defensible. They wanted the armistice to survive. As negotiators argued, battles continued to rage. At Port Chop Hill, nearly a 1,000 US soldiers were killed or injured, fighting over a plot of land of no strategic value. It seemed the fighting would never end. We didn't know too much about what was going on with the negotiations, except they were happening. All of us hoped and thought any day we were going to have a treaty sign. You always thought, I don't want to be the last one to die in this war. Eventually, the two sides agreed not to accept the 38th parallel. They would accept a demilitarized zone on each side of the line of battle. So there would be a minor retreat of anywhere from three to five kilometers at the end of the war. But it would be essentially the battle line. Then the exodus begins, and from the disputed hills, hundreds of thousands of men pull back, and there's not a regret in a truckload. The new border had serious consequences for many Koreans. Families were permanently separated as territory. Once part of the South, came under northern control. Kaizong, Park Kyung Soon's hometown, was caught behind enemy lines. Her mother, fearing what might happen to her daughter, told her to flee. Nunatalga, on the 27th of July, 1953, an armistice was finally reached between the UN, China, and North Korea. It called for a cessation of hostilities until an official peace treaty could be signed. North Korea was completely destroyed, not a building left standing. South Korea was completely destroyed. China lost a million people. Mao lost his own son. 
And U.S. too, what do we accomplish after three years of destruction? Uh, we're left with where we started, with the, with, with the DMZ and the 38th parallel. Most of us, when we came back, uh, really felt like we had not accomplished much. The American people generally, most of them really didn't even know where we'd been. No one could gin up enthusiasm for a victory parade because there wasn't a victory. In fact, when the troops came home, there was this armistice. There was the possibility that they might have to go back. The war was far from over. There was no official peace treaty. Thousands of POWs awaited repatriation, and continuing tensions forced President Eisenhower to commit thousands of troops along the border. The world had lost interest in events in Korea, but the luxury of forgetting the war was not possible for Koreans. Three years of bloody conflict left both countries devastated. After the armistice was signed, the Korean Peninsula was basically a field of rubble. The United States dropped more ordnance on North Korea in that three-year war than we dropped during the entire Second World War. Uh, basically leveled the country. The southern side of the peninsula was no better. Everything was leveled. They were starting very much from scratch. Despite receiving millions of American dollars to rebuild South Korea, the country remained destitute. Sing Mun Rhee continued his authoritarian rule, his government rife with corruption. Sing Mun Rhee ruled the country ostensibly as a constitutional democracy, but really in a very brutal and ruthless way, very cliquish, focusing on providing benefits to his followers, uh, punishing his detractors, and he essentially sought economic assistance from the United States and from other countries, but was using it largely to subsidize his own rule and was not really putting it into an economic plan. In the countryside and in major cities, food and basic resources remained scarce for years. I was raised in Gangnam, Apgu uh, Jeongdong in Gangnam, with Sai, the singer, sings about it. Um, so I have a memory of that when it was just a field and it's none of these buildings. South Korea, people forget, was one of the poorest countries in the world. In North Korea, Kim Il-sung oversaw a rapid transformation of his country, rebuilding it to glorify his image. After the end of the Korean War, the North Korean economy developed quite rapidly because they had a great deal of support from the Soviet Union and from Communist China. Kim Il-sung used the painful memory of the war to bolster his authority. After the war, Kim Il-sung was in a very uh, vulnerable position because he led the country into this disaster. But Kim Il-sung is a survivor. The way the North Koreans learned about the Korean War is that the United States, first of all, divided the Korean Peninsula, then invaded North Korea. But under the great leadership of Kim Il-sung, the North Koreans emerged victorious. Yet you have to continually fight against the Americans because Americans are bent on destruction of North Korea. Uh, and this is sort of repeated over and over and over. To strengthen this mythology and consolidate his power, Kim enforced a series of brutal purges. And then a huge uh, purge happens in 58 and 59. Some people say like 100,000 people then are killed. By 61, he's totally in power. Kim created a political philosophy to govern the country. He called it Juche, a doctrine that focused on independence, nationalism, and most importantly, self-defense. <laughs> 
그러니까 미국이 전쟁을 일으켰고 어, 그리고 김일성이가 그 전쟁을 승리로 이끈 음, 전설적 지도자다. 이렇게 기, 교육을 받았죠. Before he defected to the South in 2004, Chan Jin Zong was a prominent North Korean propaganda officer. 수령은 당연히 신이고 그리고 주민은 무조건 복종해야 된다. 이것을 당연시 했죠. 북한 주민들이 정서와 생각, 의식 이런 감성 독재에 북한 주민들을 가두는 것이죠. 두 가지 정서, 다시 말해서 충성 정서와 또 적에 대한 중화가 필요한 것이. 북한은 미국에 대해서 북한은 그 정권 차원에서 3대 주족을 규정했어요. 그러니까 미국, 일본, 남한인 거죠. Though increasingly isolated, Kim Il Sung held on to his vision to build an army strong enough to defend against America and South Korea and to one day unify the peninsula. By 1968, South Korea had emerged from a corrupt and economically stagnant era that had marred Syng Mun Rhee's administration. Under the leadership of General Park Chung-hee, a military leader with a modernist bent, South Korea's economy was booming. By the late 1960s and early 70s, Park Chung-hee implemented an export-oriented economy, and it was through his guidance that South Korea, as we know it, really began to take off economically. I mean, he was also a dictator, but he was able to create the economic platform from which South Korea could then develop into a democracy. While South Korea's prosperity was praised across the Western world, to Kim Il-sung and North Korea, it was a threat. As South Korea started to take off economically, North Korea then saw the window for reunification closing because it had surpassed North Korea's economy. Um, North Korea was going down economically, South Korea was going up. With thousands of American troops sitting on the border and a well-armed South Korean military, Kim Il-sung saw his chance to unite the peninsula disappearing. Between 1967 and 1972, it did look like that North Koreans really wanted to restart hostilities and maybe create havoc by successful assassinations of high-level officials. So a short period, which is sometimes called the Second Korean War, began. And it was at that point that North Korea then begins a series of provocative actions in order to reunify the peninsula under Kim Il-sung's rule. On January 21st, 1968, Kim Il-sung ordered his most brazen military operation since the end of the war. A unit of highly trained North Korean commandos cut their way through barbed wire along the DMZ and slipped into the South with fake military uniforms and papers. The orders from Kim Il-sung were explicit. Their instructions were basically to go to the Blue House, to kill the South Korean president, Park Chung-hee, to cut off his head and to bring it back to North Korea. The North Koreans got within yards of the president before they were discovered, and the assassination was foiled. And I sincerely hope Kim Il-sung and his people up north recognize the futility and the unwisdom of continuing this action. Days later, North Korea captured the USS Pueblo. The ship's 82-man crew was bound, blindfolded, and transported to Pyongyang, where they were charged as spies. For 11 months, the ship's crew was tortured and subjected to harsh interrogations. The North Koreans committed yet another wanton and aggressive act by seizing an American ship and its crew, clearly 
This cannot be accepted. By the winter of 1968, America was being dragged towards conflict in Korea, just as the war in Vietnam was heating up. Park Jin-hee is furious. He wants to go north. He wants to seek revenge for the Blue House raid. But all the other powers around the Korean Peninsula, of course, are not interested in restarting the Korean War. The Americans are bogged down in Vietnam. The Soviet Union has distractions in Eastern Europe. It invades Czechoslovakia in 1968. And the Chinese are involved in their cultural revolution. So the outside powers outside of the Korean Peninsula have no interest in starting the Korean War. But the two Koreas want, uh, again, to start a war. With pressure from America, President Park stood down. The American crew of the Pueblo were released in December 1968. The ship was never returned. Simmering tensions between the two Koreas continued throughout the 70s and 80s, with Kim attempting to undermine the South's burgeoning prosperity. And then the Soviet Union establishes diplomatic relations with South Korea in 1990. China follows in 1992. So North Korea is now diplomatically isolated and unable to deal with South Korea on any equal terms. And it's that time then that the North Korean regime seeks its nuclear program for its own security. On the 8th of July, 1994, Kim Il-sung died. Kim Il-sung died when he was a man of the world. He died for three years. He died for a long time. He died for three years. He Kuruki啊 Kim's son, Kim Jong-il, became supreme leader. He inherited a country in crisis. The collapse of the Soviet Union in the early 90s devastated the North Korean economy, and the series of successive famines killed an estimated one million Koreans. Yet even as his people were starving, Kim ramped up his father's nuclear ambitions. So everyone really thinks at that point that North Korea is going to collapse, and yet it doesn't. Kim Jong-il continues with his nuclear program, and he knows that that is the only leverage he has for survival. For North Korea, nuclear weapons are not only the ultimate sign of strength, but they have meaning for North Korea and their history. Because Kim Il-sung saw how Japan's occupation of Korea, which looked like it would never end, suddenly being terminated by two atomic bombs that the United States dropped on Japan. They saw China explode a nuclear device in 1964 and then become a permanent member of the UN Security Council these are the interpretations, the lessons the North Koreans learned from the ability to have nuclear weapons. Despite international pressure on Kim Jong-il to give up his nuclear program, on the 9th of October 2006, North Korea completed a successful nuclear weapons test, achieving a long-cherished ambition. And after his sudden death in 2011, his son, Kim Jong-un, vowed to continue the family's nuclear dream. 
Now here's this guy who's a young guy, educated in the West. He was not introduced to the North Korean public until a year before his father's death in 2011. And yet he comes in there and is able to consolidate his power so quickly. That just shows the power of the Kim Il-sung myth and how it's still alive. He knows that Kim Il-sung had uh, popularity and love uh, of the Korean people, North Korean people. So he, that's why he wanted to sort of even look like his grandfather, the way he dresses, his haircut, just the whole uh, outer appearance looks like his grandfather. And his behavior is also more like his grandfather. In September 2016, North Korea tested their fifth and most powerful nuclear warhead. The North Koreans, the message that their leaders give them is that we're not going to let the United States do to us what they did between 1950 and 53, and that's why we need nuclear weapons, and that's why we need to have missiles that can deliver them to the continental United States. The United States started entering negotiations from the Clinton administration onwards. And in all of these cases, what the United States has put on offer is remarkably consistent, which is the promise of normal political relations, the promise of a peace treaty ending the Korean War, uh, economic assistance, energy assistance. Um, all of these things would be on offer to North Korea if they did one thing, which is give up their nuclear weapons and ballistic missiles. But I think the main lesson we've learned from all of this is that the problem is not the United States. The problem is that North Korea doesn't want to give up its weapons. In the end, the prospects for peace could hinge not on Western powers, but on the two leaders of this long divided nation and on its people, still separated by a never ending conflict. This is a blip in the history of Korea. This division since 1945 and then the Korean War since 1950. It's same ethnic makeup, same language, same culture. The two Koreas were one Korea for thousands of years. We don't get fairy tale endings on the Korean Peninsula. So whether it is the uh, Japanese occupation of Korea, the start of the Korean War in 1950, democratization in South Korea in 1987, the list goes on and on. History has shown that change on the Korean Peninsula always comes suddenly. It never comes gradually. <laughs>